Okay, thank you, and uh, thank you also to thanks to the organizers for for the invitation. Although, uh, as everybody, I, I would have preferred to be to be in Vienna. Uh, so I will speak about uh, an ongoing work. Uh, it's not finished yet. Uh, so it's in collaboration with uh, Vincent Millot and uh, Rémi Rodiac uh, about actually the critical points of the Ambrosio torturelli functional and uh, their uh, asymptotic analysis. So um, in this uh, first slide, I will recall uh, uh, very basic uh, facts about uh, Mumforcha and Ambrosio Tortorelli uh, functionals that I think many of you already know. So, uh, so I will work in, a, in any space dimension, uh, so in an open set omega, which is as smooth as you want. And I will, to fix the, the, the problem, I will, I will work with uh, um, smooth Dirichlet boundary conditions. Although I will not be, be, very, be, be very precise on uh, how I formulate it uh, precisely. So the Manforcha functional is uh, this, uh, this functional defined here, uh, which is defined in the energy space, uh, which is usually called SBV2, uh, which uh, so I think all of you already know that, but just to, to make sure that uh, we, are, we agree on notations. So these are BV functions, which have no counterparts. Hein? And the, the gradient here is intended as um, the smooth part of the gradient. It is supposed to belong to L2. And the jump set, JU, uh, so it's N minus one dimensional set. It is supposed to have a finite, a finite, uh, some finite measure, okay? And so I impose boundary conditions that U should be equal to G on the boundary. So I put it in quotation marks because uh, as you may know, uh, uh, in this type of free discontinuity problem, why should one should uh, rather add a, um, a surface energy on the boundary. But I will not focus on this type of things. So uh, there is also a well-known um, phase field approximation of uh, this functional, which is called the ambroso tortorelli functional which uh, roughly consists in replacing the discontinuity set, Ju, by um, a phase field variable that I call V. So you essentially replace the, 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 the jump part, uh, the, 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 the measure of the jump set by this modica mortola type uh, functional expressed in terms of this. So there is a, a scaling parameter epsilon. So when you want to minimize this functional, you see that if you only consider this part of the energy, V wants to be, uh, to be identically equal to one to make this uh, to be equal to zero. But there is a coupling term here, V squared times gradu squared, which um, imposes in some sense that where gradu is not zero and where actually where gradu is very large, V should be equal to zero in order to make this as small as possible. So there is a competition between these two, uh, these two minimization, uh, uh, these two energy terms. And uh, actually in the limit, uh, when epsilon is very small, V should be uh, very close to one everywhere, except on a very small part of the domain where the gradient is allowed to be very large. And this small part of the domain will be some type of epsilon neighborhood of the jump set. So, uh, this uh, has been uh, made precise by Ambroso Tortorelli, who proved uh, a gamma convergence result that provided your parameter, which is here is uh, small enough. And I will, I'm going to set it to be zero in the, in the next slides to make things easier. The Ambroso Tortorelli functional gamma converges to the Mumforcha function. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, as a, an immediate consequence of gamma convergence, you, you get convergence of global minimizers of the ambroso tortorelli functional to, um, uh, so, U epsilon, uh, so V epsilon will converge to one, okay, because of this term, uh, and U epsilon will converge to a function U, which will be a global minimizer of the Manforcha function. Okay, so these, these are very standard facts about ambroso tortorelli, and I, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I think many of you already know, know it uh, by heart. So next, uh, uh, so let me uh, still keep uh, this slide. So uh, this new functional is more pleasant in the sense that instead of working in a space with discontinuities, which are by the way unknowns on the problem, 
uh, you work on the uh, on the functional space. So U and V belong to very uh, standard subolef spaces, and the functional looks quite uh, quite pleasant because it looks like an elliptic functional. Let's say uh, this is almost true, except that there is one uh, particular. Uh, uh, the, uh, drawback of this functional is that it is non-convex. It is non-convex due to this coupling term, coupling term B squared guard U squared, and it makes uh, the, for instance, the numerical research of global minimizer very, uh, very difficult because if you, you apply standard methods such like uh, gradient descent methods, uh, you don't know uh, to where your method is going to converge. So this is a very serious issue in uh, numerics. And um, so uh, uh, an idea to, to perform a numerical simulation, uh, which has been adopted, for instance, by Blaise Bourdin in the context of fracture, uh, is to perform an alternate minimization. Because although this functional is uh, not convex, it is separately convex. You fix U, it is strictly convex and differentiable with respect to V. And you fix V, it is convex, strictly convex and differentiable with respect to U. So the idea is to alternatively minimize with respect to U and V and uh, by uh, some kind of fixed point argument, uh, prove that you are going to cover to, to something. So uh, this is exactly uh, what does this alternate minimization method. The point is that in general, um, due to the failure of uh, global convex of convexity with respect to the pair U and V, you not, in general, converge uh, to a global minimizer of the homozotorturally functional, but to a critical point. So what is a critical point? So that I'm going to call U epsilon V epsilon. So it will be a solution of the system of uh, PDEs, of elliptic PDEs. So, there is a, so this is a coupling PDE because you see that the first equation, so the main unknown, I should say, is U, but the coefficient in the divergence term depends on V. And then you have an elliptic equation on with respect to V uh, for the second equation with a coupling term here, which depends on U. And you have directly boundary conditions. So this is, uh, in general, to what uh, such a... Um, such, uh, um, such, uh, uh, an algorithm will convert to a critical point. And as I said before, since the Ambrosio-Tortorelli functional is not convex, a critical point might not be a global minimizer. So, um, so it makes, uh, it's, it justifies why uh, it, uh, it, uh, it would be interesting to understand the asymptotic behavior of critical points. And I should say that there is an additional information which comes from this addition, from this alternate minimization uh, algorithm is that um, uh, you get a uniform bound on the ambrosio tortorelli function. So the, uh, the, the ambrosio tortorelli energy of such a critical point is uniformly bounded with respect to epsilon. Okay, so, uh, so the question uh, is to understand the asymptotic behavior of such a critical point under an energy bound like that. So this is, of course, related to, to many other problems uh, where a phase field approximation can be, uh, can be, uh, can be um, obtained. And the first uh, classical example is that of uh, Allen Kahn. So there is a classical modica mortola approximation of the perimeter, which implies the convergence of global minimizers. But the, the con proving the convergence of critical points of the modica mortola functional of the Allen Kahn equation is, um, is, uh, is much more delicate and it, uh, it has been done in several contexts, essentially by Tonegawa and his co-authors. Uh, and it uses uh, geometric measure theory arguments uh, uh, to prove in the best case that critical points of the Allen-Kahn equation will converge to a minimal surface. That is a critical point of the perimeter in some sense. So these are very involved uh, works and arguments. And I would like to mention a, a very interesting work by Stenberg and Lee, um, uh, which prove uh, such, a, such a result, but we, the, the, this is, an, they prove, a, they gave an, um, an elementary proof using the additional, the additional assumption that not only you have an energy bound, but you have a, an assumption on the convergence of the energy. So, Using this additional knowledge, 
you can easily prove the convergence of critical points uh, by interpreting the first variation of the modica mortola functional as a convex functional of a measure and applying a Rechetniak type uh, continuity theorem. This type of problem also are also related to Ginsburg Landau uh, uh, problems. So the convergence of uh, um, uh, critical points of the Ginsburg Landau functional also in parabolic setting. So these are various works uh, around uh, Betuel, Brezi, Celin, Orlandi, and Sandy and Zerfati. And in the context of Ambroso Tortorelli, uh, uh, there is um, a complete study which has been performed by Frank Forlis and Zerfati. Um, and on the other hand, by Lay uh, alone uh, for a different type of boundary condition in dimension one. So our objective uh, was to try to generalize the result to any dimension. And we partially did it uh, uh, with an additional assumption as uh, in this work on the convergence of uh, the energy. So, so, so the claim is uh, uh, you have a gamma convergence result and you want to prove that uh, critical points of your approximated functional will converge to the critical point of the gamma limit. But there is no general theory which tells you that. So uh, you have to find a ad hoc uh, 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 proof to, to, to prove it or disprove it because it might not be, to, it might not be true. So uh, before um, uh, explaining what we did, uh, let me uh, give, say some word about critical points of the Mumford function because this is where we expect to converge. So uh, there are essentially two ways, two known ways of doing variations. The first one is doing uh, so-called outer variations, uh, where um, starting from um, a fixed function u, you are just doing variation in the uh, in the state space. So you are uh, essentially computing the gato derivative of your functional um, uh, in some direction phi, which belongs to the same class of u. And you have to assume that the jump set of your competitor or your direction is contained in that of the jump set. And what you get, uh, so the outer variation gives you that the approximate gradient of U is divergence free. So be careful because this is not a Laplacian, this is the divergence of the approximate gradient. And in some weak sense that the normal derivative of U vanishes on the jump set. So uh, this is not very good because um, by doing such a variation, you don't move the jump set. Okay, so you don't see, uh, you are not doing variation with, with respect to, to the jump set. So another way, which is also classical in this kind of uh, geometric variational problems is to perform inner variations. So to do that, you start from a vector field capital X, compactly supported in omega, and you uh, associate to capital X the flow. Uh, so which I denote by phi T, which is um, a deform of the smooth deformorphism from omega onto itself. And what you do is that you compose U with the inverse of the flow. Uh, you look at its Montfort energy and you compute the derivative with respect to T at T equals to zero. So this can be done, this can be explicitly computed. This is the classical, uh, classical computation. And it gives you the following expression, uh, which gives you here in a weak sense, the, the divergence of this, uh, this tensor. And here, uh, a jump part, which involves the tangential divergence of your uh, vector field, which by integration by parts is nothing but the, the curvature up to the sum. And this should vanish. So this, these are inner variations. So uh, we want to recover, uh, we would like to recover this type of, uh, of um, of uh, properties for limits of the ambroso tortorelli uh, critical points. So, um, so we start from a, a critical point u epsilon v epsilon of the ambroso tortorelli functional with uniformly bounded energy. Uh, and for simplicity, as I said before, I set the constant eta to be equal to zero. So this is a system of PDEs uh, that uh, u and v, u epsilon and v epsilon satisfy. And uh, a first consequence of the uh, energy bound, so this is a very classical stuff. This is the first step you do in gamma convergence. This is compactness. So you get compactness on u epsilon and v epsilon. 
So of course, the epsilon will converge to one uh, as, as before. U epsilon will converge to some limit, which is U, which is in SBV and in infinity. Uh, and by weak convergence, you get this lower bound on the bulk energy. Okay, this is just the lower semi-continuity of the norm with respect to weak convergence. Uh, yes, sorry, I forgot to say that the coupling term, sorry, V epsilon grad U epsilon converges weakly to grad U in L2. So the weak convergence implies this lower bound on the bulk energy. But there is an additional variable here, uh, uh, which I call W epsilon, which, uh, which naturally appears by looking at the phase field energy so you use the classical modica Bortola trick, so a squared plus b squared larger than 2ab, and it gives you a, a bound from below uh, of, uh, of, of this expression by one minus v, uh, by the modulus of one minus v times the gradient of v, okay? And this is nothing but the gradient of the function that I call w epsilon, which is uh, v epsilon minus v epsilon squared over two. So this is just an algebraic manipulation. So this inequality is just a Young's inequality. And um, so it gives you in particular um, BV bound on the gradient of V epsilon, of W epsilon, which must, whose gradient must converge to something. And this something has no choice to be zero because since V converges to one, W will converge to one half to a constant. So the gradient will converge to a constant. And then uh, this is one of the main, uh, of the difficult part of the lower bound of the, of the Ambroso Tortorelli theorem that you can bound from below this term by the jump set of, of the function u, the limit of u, the limit of u epsilon. So these are very classical uh, uh, things uh, that uh, was already proved by Ambroso Tortorelli uh, and many of its uh, of their variant. And now comes uh, our, uh, additional assumption that the energy is converging. So under this additional assumption, so this is an assumption, I'm not saying that I am justifying it, although we can justify it in some cases. So if I have time, if I have time, I will say a word about it. But under this assumption, we can actually improve the previous convergences. So first, the weak convergence of V epsilon, grad U epsilon can be improved into a strong convergence then uh, we can not only identify the weak limit of grad W epsilon, but also on its modulus. And its modulus turns out to be, the limit of the modulus turns out to be exactly the uh, surface measure of the jump set. Okay. And finally, there is also a last property, which, which is reminiscent in all these kind of uh, critical point convergence problems, which is the so-called equi-repartition of the energy. So in the phase field energy, you have two terms, which are written here and here. And the equi-repartition of energy tells you that both terms have essentially the same limit. So this is what we say here. So epsilon grad V squared minus uh, the other term, 10 to zero in L1. So both terms be have the same weight, essentially. And you can also relate uh, this equal repartition of the energy to the to the fun, to the to, to this um, function, the modulus of grad W epsilon, which is important because it is actually this term which will make appear the jump set, and still in L1 distance, this term, um, the, the, the L1 distance between this term and uh, uh, the, twice the first part of the phase field energy tends to zero. So this is the repartition of the energy. Okay, so, so this is what we get, and this is not difficult to obtain. I mean, once we do this assumption, of course, this is not very difficult to obtain. So then um, we can proceed, but uh, in order to proceed, uh, we need higher regularity on the solutions of, um, of the system of PDE that satisfy critical points. And uh, this is um, a theorem that we proved with uh, Vincent Miu and Rémi Rodiak, um, uh, and which was not easy, actually. Uh, so it uses a lot all known tools of uh, elliptic regularity, Schauder's estimate, Campanato, uh, More Campanato estimates. 
So you can essentially prove that your solutions are as smooth as you want uh, if you assume enough regularity on the data, uh, which are the, 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 the set and the boundary, uh, the boundary condition. So you can essentially as assume that u epsilon v epsilon is as smooth as you want. And in order to derive an equation uh, in which we are going to pass to the limit to recover uh, critical points of the Mumford-Shaw functional, we multiply uh, the, the equation satisfied by u epsilon and v epsilon by this test function. So you take a vector field, capital X, and you take this test function, x dot grad u epsilon and x dot grad v epsilon. You are allowed to take them as test function because you are smooth. So then you perform integration by parts. You have the right to do it because you have enough regularity. And you end up with a formula like that. And then you want to pass to the limit in both terms. So the first term, which involves the gradient of u epsilon, is now easy to pass to the limit because we know from, the pre, from, um, from uh, our assumptions that we have strong convergence of the term grad uh, v epsilon, grad u epsilon to grad u. So thanks to the strong convergence, you can pass to the limit in this first term, which is rewritten here, and you get uh, that it converges to the analogous one when epsilon tends to zero. And of course, the main difficulty consists in passing to the limit in the phase field uh, term uh, part uh, here, uh, because it is this term which would make appear the jump set. Okay, and this is uh, where the difficulty is concentrated. So I rewrote here this term and uh, using, so now we are going to use the equivalent partition of energy, which tells you that um, uh, this term, asymptotically behave like this term. So I can replace this by epsilon grad v squared, which appears now with a factor two, which I put in factor uh, in front of the integral here. Okay, then, so this is with uh, this symbol here because it is uh, in the limit when epsilon tends to zero. Then I just uh, factorize by grad v squared here, and I get, uh, this uh, bracket here, which involves, um, okay, I get this bracket here. And then I use again the equal repartition of energy, which tells me that this term in the limit behave like this one. So I can replace this term by the modulus of grad W epsilon, okay? And then here I have modified my bracket by replacing V epsilon by W epsilon. And this, this is just a consequence of the fact that the gradient of V epsilon is parallel to the, of W epsilon, sorry, is parallel to the gradient of V epsilon. And this term is non-negative. Okay, so they have the same direction. The, the gradient of W epsilon and the gradient of V epsilon have the same directions. Okay, so this is what you get. And uh, this shows actually a um, so-called very false structure uh, on this uh, on this uh, phase field part of the of the of the first variation. So what does it mean? So uh, so maybe before, how much time do I have, Mar Martin? Uh, maybe I am already done. Actually, no, 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 no. I think you you can still talk to like 16, 17. So I think we have 10, 10 minutes. I would say. Ah, okay, we, okay. So yeah, I have. We, time. we shifted by five minutes, and there was still a delay. So okay, so. okay, okay. Thank you. So um, so what is a very fold in a few words? So um, things that so when you have a set, you can associate to this set naturally the measure restricted to this set. So you have information just on the position of the set. But when you want to recover uh, first order information at of order, at order one, which is what we do when we write Euler-Lagrange equation, it is natural to, uh, to encode also informations on the, um, on the tangent plate, the tangent plane to, to this set, to the surface here, I'm considering surfaces. So a very fold will be actually an object, a measure, which encodes not only information uh, on space, but also on the, on, the, on the tangent plane. So it will be a measure on, uh, on the cross product, on the, on the, 
product space between omega and all n minus one dimensional hyperplanes of Rn. So uh, this is what I call Gn minus one, the n minus one Grassmannian, if you want, which I simply think of being all matrices of this form, identity minus e tensor e, because these are all projection matrices onto n minus one dimensional hyperplanes uh, whose uh, orthogonal vector is given by the vector e. So think of a measure defined on the product space between omega and all this set of matrices. So I define a measure of very false, so V epsilon, by its action on the test function on the product, on the product space like that. So I integrate my test function uh, uh, where I put uh, as argument, so X for the position. And here I put uh, for uh, the projection matrix, this matrix, which is here with a minus sign. So identity minus grad V epsilon, uh, renormalized tensor, tensorial product with itself and integrated with respect to, to, this, um, to this measure. So maybe, uh, uh, so this is not useful for what I'm going to do, but maybe it's useful for understanding what, uh, what is the meaning of this, uh, of this very fold. If you use the coherea formula, you can rewrite this integral as the average along all level sets of the function W epsilon of the function phi uh, evaluated at X and the projection matrix. This is a projection matrix onto the tangential um, uh, hyperplane uh, uh, to, 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 this, to this set, okay? And then you, you average with respect to all uh, possible, um, um, uh, um, uh, level sets of uh, of W epsilon, which are in between zero and one half, because V belongs to zero and one. So W epsilon uh, takes its values between zero and one half. So this is maybe a, a more natural way to to, um, to to understand this this measure, but but it will, it will not use be useful for for what I'm going to do. Okay, so this is the definition of the very fold. And with this definition, I can rewrite now this expression as the integral uh, with respect to this very fold, which is a measure in X and A of the function. So minus, there is a minus sign because you see here the bracket, uh, uh, the matrix appears in the other order. So minus A dot product grad capital X of X. So this is my function, if you want. Uh, this is my function phi of x a is minus a dot grad capital X of x. Okay. So this is just uh, up to now, this is just a complicated way to rewrite the same thing. I did nothing. Now, the point is that this object will enable us to pass to the limit. So first of all, um, almost by definition, the, the, the very full V epsilon is uniformly bounded with respect to epsilon uh, uh, as, a, as a measure. So it quickly converges to a, to a limit measure that I call V, uh, which is a general measure in the product space, uh, omega across the n minus one dimensional uh, subspaces of Rn. Okay, but now uh, I'm going to consider uh, the so what I denote between two bars like that is a, is a usually called the mass of the variable. This is just the projection of the variable on the special variable omega defined on omega. So if you come back to the definition of V epsilon here, when you project this measure on the special variable, it means that you take a test function here independent of the second variable. And this is just the measure uh, mod grad W epsilon dx. Okay. So the projection of V epsilon on the spatial variable is the modulus, the mod of grad W epsilon. But this measure, I know from before that it converges to the HN minus one measure of the jump set. Okay. This was the consequence of my assumption of convergence of the energy. But on the other end, I know that the mass of a variable will always converge to the mass of its limit. This is a, 
because you take essentially the test function one with respect to the variable uh, a here. So in that way, we have identified, so V, which is a general measure in this product space, we have more information now about it because we know that its projection onto the spatial variable is the HN minus one dimensional measure restricted to the jump set. So when you have a measure on the product space and you know its projection onto uh, one of the products, you can disintegrate this measure with respect to, uh, to, its to its projection. So this is what we do here. And you get the existence of probability measures, Vx. So uh, they are pa parameterized by the spatial variable x, which belongs to omega. But these are measures on, uh, n, uh, on the set of all uh, n minus 1 dimensional subspaces. And integrated a function with respect to the very fold uh, v of xa consists in first integrating your function with respect to the variable a by the measure vx of a, this one, and afterwards integrating with respect to the projection, which is just the hn minus one measure restricted to ju. Okay. So with this uh, rewriting in that way uh, the, the limit very fold, uh, if we want to pass to the limit in this uh, in this term, which is an, an expression of the first variation of the uh, involving the, the the variable uh, the phase field variable, we can pass to the limit, and when we pass to the limit, we end up with this expression. And this expression, so we don't know what it is in general. We have more information, but we don't know what it is. But we know to 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 um how to say uh, to um. To, uh, to characterize it, we just need to understand this, uh, this term, which is the first moment of the measure Vx. So the, dis the, the disintegration of V with respect to, uh, to, its to its projection. So in order to understand this term, to characterize this term, we just need to understand this term here, to which I will give a name. So I call this term uh, A bar of X. So this is the first moment of the measure Vx. So once I know a bar of x, so I know what it is, what is this expression, and I am able to pass to the limit in, um, in the first variation. So to uh, identify this term, we perform a blow-up analysis, so similar to, to what was done by Ambrosio and Sonner uh, in, a, in a Ginsburg Landau uh, context. So the goal was essentially the same. It was in a parabolic setting, but the, the goal was to pass to the limit in a parabolic Ginsburg Landau equation. Jean uh, so you have like two minutes, maybe? I have two minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I have two slides, so that's perfect. Um, so um, this, um, this uh, matrix, A bar of X, we can quite easily prove this property so that it is a non-negative matrix. Its trace is equal to n minus one, so n is the dimension, and that its spectral radius is one. Uh, so if you think that you are in dimension two, maybe to simplify, when you have a non-negative uh, um, um, matrix, which is non-negative, uh, whose trace is equal to one and whose higher uh, eigenvalue is one, you have no choice you have two eigenvalues which are zero and one, okay? So it is necessarily a matrix of this form. It is a matrix of this form, and you can prove the same in any dimension by looking closely at, at the blow-up analysis, actually. And when you perform the blow-up analysis, so the very fold will converge to a limit very fold by blowing up, and the limit very fold will be the tensor product of the n minus one dimensional measure restricted to the tangent space of the jump set at some point x zero uh, product with the, the um, Dirac mass on this matrix. Okay, so this is a very simple um, uh, very fold, which can prove to be stationary. So stationary means this. Okay, so I'm going fast now, and uh, for stationary very folds, you have a so-called monotonicity formula. And when you write down the monotonicity formula, you, um, you can characterize what is this vector E, and you can prove that it is exactly 
the, the normal to the tangent space of Ju, which is a normal to the jump set. So you are fully characterized in that way. This uh, limit matrix, the, fir the, the first moment of Vx. And um, so if you plug this information into, um, into, uh, into uh, uh, the, the previous, uh, the previous uh, in the passage to the limit, you get uh, finally um, the, desired, uh, the desired results, which is summarized here in the theorem. So, uh, so I should consider also boundary condition, but I won't speak about that. So assume that you have um, a smooth enough uh, uh, critical point of the Ambrosio Tortorelli functional, which whose energy is uniformly bounded. So you first converge to uh, a limit function u, uh, which is of class SBV2, which satisfies almost the outer variations in the sense that its approximate gradient is divergent free. But unfortunately, we, have, we don't know whether or not the, the, the normal derivative is uh, equal to zero or not. And if um, you further assume that you have convergence of the energy, then the limit function u, this one, will be a critical point of, um, of the, of the Monforcia functional. It will satisfy the inner variation, um, criticality condition involving inner variation, which is this equation. So actually, in what I did before, I had zero on the right hand side. Uh, actually, I don't have zero because I have to consider boundary terms, but these are lower order terms, which, uh, uh, which, uh, which are not that relevant for, for, um, to understand um, the technique. And actually, our result is a little bit stronger. Uh, we uh, actually prove the, the convergence of the first inner variation of the ambrosio tortorelli functional to the first inner variation of the moment for functional as well as the second, inner, uh, second order inner, inner variation. So I didn't write down explicitly what are the expression of the second inner variation because it takes several lines. It is a nightmare to write, but, um, but uh, our method also allows to pass to the limit in the second inner variation. Okay, so I think uh, I passed my two minutes. I stop here and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jean-Francois, for your talk. And uh, I think uh, because uh, now uh, we have a break, so is there any very quick question then? So, Gilles, maybe ask one, uh, yeah. And then the other question I suggest to postpone to the break because we are a little bit running out of uh, the just, schedule. Just a quick question, the answer is yes or no. Uh, with the alternate minimization, uh, can do you know if uh, do you now know if uh, you converge to the energies converge to the? I don't know. No, no. I would love to 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 love to to prove that, but I don't know. Okay. I don't know. That would already be very good to know that uh, the limit of uh, an alternate minimization is uh, stable, for instance, but we don't even know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but in dimension, so I didn't say that. But in dimension one, we can prove that. Uh, the convergence in a, of, of the energy is satisfied. So actually, our result is not empty in dimension one. Um, but, uh, but in general, we don't know. Mm -hmm.